Hey everyone, this video is the beginning of my 100 Bullets coverage. 100 Bullets was a comic series published from 1999 to 2009. It spanned 100 issues and was collected in 13 trade paperbacks. It was uh, written by Brian Azzarello and drawn by Eduardo Riso. Riso has a very cool art style. He loves playing with shadows. He loves drawing some sexy women as well. Now, uh, this book is a multi-award winning book, winning several Harvey and Eisner awards. It is a crime noir book, but it has an overall kind of high concept. So, what is the premise of this book? There is this character, an older man who wears a suit. His name is Agent Graves, and Graves goes around the country giving people a briefcase. And inside the briefcase is a gun and 100 bullets. And there's also some evidence in the briefcase of someone that wronged a certain individual in their lives. So, Graves gives people the opportunity to get revenge on the people that wronged them. And he tells them that if they use the gun and the bullets, they will get away with murder. They will not be prosecuted. The bullets are untraceable. And if they are ever collected as evidence, it will just be thrown out. So, that is sort of the basic premise. But throughout the series, it ties into an overall conspiracy with various families and organizations, and it becomes very intriguing, and there is lots of mystery. Who is Agent Graves? How is he able to do this and get let these people get away with murder? What is his motivation? And it's going to tie into uh, a whole bunch of history, and it becomes very intriguing as it goes on. However, I will say... This series is probably the strongest in the beginning, and maybe gets a little bit convoluted as it goes on, but it is always a wild ride. So, that is the premise of 100 Bullets. I hope I hyped you all up for this series. And for now, let's dive into Volume 1 and uh, see how this mystery takes off. 100 Bullets, Volume 1, First Shot, Last Call, written by Brian Azzarello and art by Eduardo Riso. This volume covers issues 1 through 5. 100 Bullets, Issue 1, Dizzy, Part 1 of 3. We are introduced to a 23-year-old Latina woman named Isabel Cordova. Although, instead of Isabel, everyone calls her Dizzy for short. Dizzy is currently in prison, although she is getting out soon on parole. Dizzy grew up in the poor, rough part of town, where crime and prison are a normal occurrence. On top of being in prison, Dizzy finds it hard to get through the day, as she recently lost her husband, Hector, and her child, Santiago. They were supposedly gunned down in the streets by a rival gang called the Vice Lords. The killers were then shortly afterwards shot down by the police. Dizzy and the rest of her family themselves belong to a gang called the Kings. On this day, Dizzy is finally released from prison on parole, and she gets on a bus that is going to take her home. While she is on that bus, an older white man in a sharply dressed suit gets on the bus. He seems out of place here. He walks over to Dizzy and asks if he can sit down. This man is the mysterious Agent Philip Graves. At this point in the story, I don't want to reveal what the deal with Agent Graves is, as it is kind of a mystery that will be revealed over time. But the mysterious Agent Graves is going to be one of our main characters we will be following in the 100 Bullets story. Graves sits beside Dizzy. Dizzy is looking at a photograph of her dead husband and child. Graves, seeing Dizzy looking at the photo, says to her, Hector and Santiago, too bad about what happened. Dizzy is confused. Who is this old man? She asks, do I know you? Graves responds, No, but I know you. Isabel Dizzy Cordova, 23 years old, just released from the Women's Correctional Facility in Statesville. Welcome back to the world. I'm Agent Graves. You were arrested when you were, what, 11 years old for shoplifting? Your second arrest occurred seven hours later, when you attempted to burn down the store you were caught robbing. That's cute. 
The next four years you spent bouncing in and out of juvie halls and lockups for gang-related activities, grabbing quite an impressive rep for yourself along the way. At 15 you appeared to settle down, but then gangbanging and breastfeeding don't seem to mix, do they? You were what, 16 when you got married? Well, the fairy tale came to an end one night in July. Graves begins talking about why Dizzy wound up in jail. Dizzy argues, I was just a passenger, I was hanging with my homegirls, I didn't know. Graves continues, right, wrong place at the wrong time. And just like that, an innocent man who got caught in the crossfire, along with him, the four other homegirls you were with, all armed were killed, as were the two away girls that fired on your car. As the sole survivor of that incident, you caught the rap. So, mommy goes to jail, daddy goes legit, minimum wage plus food stamps and baby makes three. You served three years, you were sentenced to do 15. Thank God for overcrowding. Agent Graves then pulls out a photograph. He shows it to Dizzy. He asks her, you recognize these men? Dizzy answers, no, who are they? Graves responds, they are the ones that killed your family. The two men in the photograph are corrupt police officers. They are Officer Morgan and Officer Swirsky. Dizzy is surprised by this. She says, bullshit, man. Hector and Santiago were gunned down in a drive-by. Graves answers, that's right. This one was driving and that one was firing. Dizzy says, nah, man, it was the Vice Lords. It was payback for what I'd done. Dizzy, she thinks it was this rival gang that killed her husband and child. But Graves tells her, trust me, it was these two crooked cops, 5-0. Dizzy doesn't believe Graves. Graves tells her, you will. Inside this attache case is irrefutable evidence that what I'm telling you is true. Also in the attache is a gun and 100 rounds of ammunition, all untraceable, all yours. Do with it as you see fit. If you act on this information, you will have carte blanche. Dizzy, unfamiliar with this French expression, asks, what's that supposed to mean? Graves continues, I've seen to it that no law enforcement agency can touch you if you choose to use terminal force. All investigations will cease once the bullets are retrieved. Dizzy still can't believe this. She asks, is this some kind of joke? Graves continues, one more thing, this is for your eyes only. If you show this to anyone or it somehow gets in another's hands, well, let's just say there will be grave repercussions. Dizzy asks, why? And Graves answers, isn't it obvious, Dizzy? They're the bad guys. Agent Graves then gets off the bus at the next stop. Now, in our first interaction with Agent Graves, we have lots of mystery and questions here. Who is this man? How does he know about Dizzy and her past? What is the deal with this attache case and the 100 bullets? If Dizzy uses this information and uses the gun and the bullets to kill someone, is it true that no investigation will be done and she will just get away with it scot-free? And if that's true, how is Agent Graves pulling this off? How does he have that kind of power? And what are his motivations? Thus, the main hook of the series is now set. And these answers will be revealed over time and we will learn how it ties into a greater conspiracy. But for now, we will just continue on with Dizzy's story. We jump across town and we see Dizzy's brother, Emilio Cordova. Emilio is with one of his homeboys, a guy named 8-Ball. They are stealing some cars for another criminal named Riza. Riza gave them a shopping list of cars that he wanted. A rich man driving one of the cars on said shopping list pulls up to a restaurant. This is Emilio's chance. He slips on a vest and makes it look like he's a valet. He then runs over to the man and offers to park the car for him. The man, assuming Emilio is a legitimate valet, hands over his keys. And then Emilio drives off with the now stolen car in what was a pretty easy job. Meanwhile, Dizzy Cordova has arrived at her childhood home. She is going to be staying here now that she is recently out of prison. Dizzy, she is talking to the photograph of her dead husband, Hector. 
She's talking about how crazy it was the things that Agent Graves was telling her. As she is doing this, Dizzy's younger sister, Lucy, walks into the room, and she gives Dizzy a big hug. Lucy asks, who was Dizzy talking to? Dizzy explains she was talking to Hector. Lucy questions, Mama's right, you crazy, Hector's dead. Dizzy explains, it's like praying. I know Hector can hear me, you know what I'm saying? Later on, Dizzy goes down to the garage where her brother and his friends usually work out of. She says hello to them all. One of them is a scrawnier looking man named Smack, and the other is a beefier looking tattooed man named Freedy. And then eventually, Dizzy's brother Emilio shows up in the car that he just recently stole. After some warm hellos, as this is the first time they've all seen each other since Dizzy got sent to prison, they share some beers, and Dizzy starts talking about her dead husband, Hector. Dizzy, she expresses how she feels guilty. She feels like if she was there, then maybe they would still be alive. Dizzy's brother Emilio tells her, no, you would have died with them. Freedy jumps in saying, look Dizzy, Hector and Santiago were killed in a drive-by. But Dizzy, she just continues and says, who says that they would have been out on that corner if I hadn't gotten my ass locked up for being a fool? Smack jumps in saying, it was the Vice Lords, baby. They took your man out. He was pushing little Santiago down the street in a stroller. It's freaking terrible, Diz. It doesn't make sense to Dizzy, though, she says. But why? Why would they take out Hector? Hector wasn't even banging no more. He went legit. Freedy throws out a theory saying, who knows? Back in the day, Hector was king shit. Some punk must have figured that if they took him down, that would up their rep. Emilio jumps in saying, hey, you should have been happy that 5 -0 caught up to them and blew them away because I would have done it if they didn't. So whoever these Vice Lord gang members were that killed this Hector and Santiago, they shortly thereafter got killed by the police. Dizzy, she's not so sure what to make of all of this anymore though. She asks her brother, you sure that's how it went down? Emilio answers, yeah, and you are too, right? Later on, Dizzy leaves her brothers and goes and walks on the streets. And as she is walking around, a cop car pulls her over. They get out of their car and greet Dizzy saying, Hey chica, yo Dizzy, I'm talking to you. Welcome back to the neighborhood. I'm Officer Swirsky, and this is my partner, Officer Morgan. Don't be scared, we're the good guys. We got wind of your parole down at the station, figured we'd say hello. These two officers are the same two dirty cops that Agent Graves told Dizzy were the ones that killed her husband and child. Officer Swirsky then goes over to Dizzy and pins her against the wall. He starts feeling her up, and then he feels the gun in the back of her pants. This is the gun that Agent Graves gave her earlier. The gun surprises Officer Swirsky, and he pulls it out and says, Oh shit, she's packing! You stupid little bitch! You leave your brains back in the joint? Don't you know carrying a piece is a parole violation? While this is happening, across town, Emilio and Smack go to drop off the stolen car to the gangster known as Rizza. Rizza, satisfied, gives Emilio a stack of bills. Emilio opens his suitcase and shoves the money in. As he opens that suitcase, Rizza can't help but notice all of the money that Emilio has in there. Rizza asks, Damn! Where'd you get all that cheddar, Emilio? You best not be copping wheels for some other player. Emilio answers, Chill, cuz. It's my savings. We cool? One of Rizza's associates tells Emilio, Yo, Holmes, it ain't right to be walking out with that kind of loot. You're gonna get your ass popped. Emilio responds, don't worry about me, S.A., I got my back covered. We jump back over to Dizzy and Officers Morgan and Swirsky. Officer Swirsky can't believe this. He tells his partner, I got off the horn with dispatch. They ran a check on this gun. And get this, they say we gotta let her go and give her back her piece. Officer Morgan replies, you gotta be kidding me. He then grabs Dizzy and tells her, Wait a minute, listen up, bitch. Any little gang skank fresh out of the block carrying heat is sure enough looking for trouble. How she got a free pass to carry, I don't know, but I sure as hell 
I'm going to find out. After this intimidating run-in with the cops, Dizzy returns to her home, and then she stares at the gun that Agent Graves gave her, and she realizes that maybe there is something to this after all. 100 Bullets, Issue 2, Dizzy, Part 2 of 3. Dizzy is in her bedroom inspecting the gun and the case that Graves gave her, when all of a sudden she gets interrupted by her mother, Bonita Cordova. Bonita had Dizzy when she was just a teenager, so Bonita is not very old herself. Bonita and Dizzy start arguing. Bonita asks her daughter, when did you get home? Dizzy answers, yesterday, thanks for the party. Bonita to this says, hey, don't blow me no shit, I had business to do. Dizzy quips back at her mom, really, you still buying food stamps from crackheads? Bonita then tells Dizzy, what got you messed up in the head? Life ain't no funeral, girl. Dizzy to this responds, funny that you would say that, living here. Dizzy is commenting on all the death around them living in the hood and how many they've lost. Bonita chastises her daughter, saying, What's so funny about that? Girl, you gotta start kicking ass for what's yours. This really sets Dizzy off. She starts yelling at her mom, What's mine? What are you talking about? Nothing's mine. None of this hood belongs to any of us. We all act so stupid. We act like it does. The lords, the kings, nothing separates them except the corners they hang on. And for all that land and cribs, they don't even own. They kill one another. The streets ain't ours. It's just the blood on them that's ours. Bonita responds, and that's why we fight. For blood. Dizzy to this, gestures to a picture of her dead husband and says, Mama, the only thing that was really mine is dead. Bonita, tired of her daughter's moping, replies, You gotta let him go, Diz. You gotta move on. When Dizzy asks her mom, where to? Her mom answers, I don't know, to the next man. Have more babies. Look, girl, understand a fact of life. If you're weak, you die. Don't be weak, baby. Don't be weak. And after that heart-to-heart mother-daughter talk, Bonita leaves. Later on that day, down by the basketball court, Dizzy's brother Amelia was playing some hoops, and he is mopping the floor with others there on the court. And he's extra cocky about it. After he wins, he says, This is my house. You chumps just tenants. Eventually, Dizzy comes by to talk with her brother. She asks if he knows the officers Swirsky and Morgan, as they tried to put the scare into her last night. Emilio says, nah, I don't know their name, just their numbers, you know. All the cops know me. I'm thug number one. I get respect from the OG and the 5-0. You want me to take him out? Ain't nobody mess with my sister. Dizzy, being frustrated with her brother, just giving silly answers, tells him, please. Moments later, Emilio gets a phone call, and then when he hangs up, he tells the others, we got business, let's go. Meanwhile, over at a local strip club, officers Morgan and Swirsky are discussing Dizzy and that gun they found on her the night before. They just don't get it. Morgan questions, don't you think it's suspicious? There ain't no law, local or federal, says a known felon on parole gets to carry a gun. So I did a little checking, and guess what? There's no record you even called in the gun. As they talk some more, eventually Officer Morgan gets a call. After the call, him and Swirsky jump into action. Later on, Dizzy is down by the park. She's talking to some old girlfriends, most of them already mothers at an early age. The girls are all telling Dizzy about the reputation of her brother. He's a popular guy on the streets. He's got a rep. Even with the old school, no one disrespects her brother Emilio. As all of the girls are talking, a whole bunch of police cars drive by. One of the police cars stops and asks the ladies in the park if they've seen anything out of the ordinary lately? A car that they haven't seen before? Someone that is not from the neighborhood? Anything? Dizzy and her friends, they don't talk to cops though. They give no answer. So the cops, they just drive on. Moments later, Dizzy's friend, Freedy, is driving by. He seems to be following the cops. Dizzy runs over and flags him to stop, 
she then gets in the car. Freedy and her drive over to where the cops were going. They follow the cops over to a bar named Big Papa's. That's where the gang, the Kings, hang out. The Kings is the group that Dizzy and all of her friends are associated with. Well, that's where the OGs hang out. And it appears a mass shooting has gone down there. Dizzy, she manages to slip inside the building. She looks around. She sees many dead. One of the cops on the scene is talking to another cop. He explains, whoever it was that shot all these people, they came in right through the front door. And judging by the spray, they didn't open fire till they were about mm, here. So most likely, most of the people here had no reason to believe they were about to die. Dizzy looks through the dead, and one of them is her friend, Smack, which we met earlier. Dizzy closes his eyes. The cops spot her, and they drag her out of here. Dizzy is dragged out into the street. And when she is in the street, she spots Officer Morgan and Swirsky. And this really sets her off. She points them out and says, It was them two. They did this. They murdered my family, don't you see? They want to kill us all. Dizzy is thrown into the back of a squad car and driven off. They're taking her down to the station. As Dizzy is being dragged away, her brother Emilio is at a restaurant nearby and saw her get taken. He is going to arrange for her bail to be paid. Dizzy is stuck in the holding cell for a while, but eventually she is told she is allowed to go. Dizzy is a little confused. She was sure she was headed back to prison. While Dizzy is being told to leave, we see a character in that police station. His name is Joseph Shepard, better known as just Mr. Shepard. He is a known associate of Agent Graves. We only see him in the background here, but he is going to be a major character throughout this whole series. He is only here because for some reason he has some sort of interest in Dizzy. Well, Dizzy is told to get out of the police station, and when she does, her brother Emilio is there waiting for her. Dizzy thanks her brother for paying for her bail. Emilio invites Dizzy to get into his car, then he begins driving her home. Dizzy asks her brother, so you know what happened? Emilio answers, you mean how you tried to go off on those two cops? Yeah, I know. What were you thinking? Who put that idea in your head? Dizzy asks, what idea? Emilio questions, that them cops took out the OGs like that. Hector and the baby too? You wrong, Dizzy. You just wrong. You know it was the vice lords that smoked them. Dizzy asks her brother, Emilio, why are you doing this? I mean, I hear the way you talk. I hear what the homies say about you. You're a big man, little brah. Emilio answers, yeah, I am. Dizzy questions her brother. Yeah, you are. I mean, I appreciate what you've done for me bailing me out, but it could have waited. Don't get me wrong, but if it was the lords that hit the kings tonight, why ain't you out there retaliating? Emilio dismisses this saying, sometimes it's best if you let the 5-0 earn their paychecks. Know what I'm saying? Dizzy responds, no, I don't. Later. Emilio warns his sister, Leave this alone, I ain't playing. Dizzy returns to her home and goes to her bedroom and she retrieves the gun that Agent Graves gave her. And then she says out loud, Neither am I. 100 Bullets, Issue 3, Dizzy, Part 3 of 3. Dizzy is in a church. She is looking at the photo of her husband and child. She is not sure what she should do, when all of a sudden, Mr. Shepard shows up behind her. He starts talking with Dizzy. Dizzy asks, who are you? Shepard answers, you can call me Mr. Shepard. Dizzy asks if he works for Agent Graves. Shepard answers, we're uh, associates. How goes your mission? Dizzy asks, Why'd you pick me for your dirty work? I get the revenge thing, but what's in it for you? Killing them cops, what's it to you? Shepard answers, nobody ever said anything about killing them. You were simply given information. Dizzy frustrated asks, oh, so now don't kill him? Look, you gave me a gun and that's supposed to make it easy, right? Shepard smoking a cigarette replies, if it were easy, they'd already be dead, wouldn't they? Dizzy questions, so what do I gotta do? Shepard answers, you don't have to do anything. Nobody's got a gun to your head. Dizzy, she then questions. She says, I'm not understanding what happened, why it happened. 
Why was my husband murdered? Was it payback from God for all the shit that I'd done to people? For not caring? For being evil? Shepard replies, you can't give it up, can you? The responsibility, I mean, for deaths you were powerless to do anything about. You needed an explanation. Someone to pin it on. Payback. It didn't matter that the police had allegedly gunned down their killers. That wasn't enough. Dizzy cuts in and says, it's not enough. It'll never be enough. Do you believe in God? Shepard, he answers, I did. I do. I guess. I don't know. I believe that everything happens for a reason. There is something we share, you and I have never met before, yet we find ourselves on the same side. It may be hard for you to understand, but everyone is connected, and I know who's holding the strings. Agent Graves gave you the real reason why your family was killed. You're fighting it because it's not the reason you chose to believe. Dizzy to this says, he didn't give me no reason, he just told me who did it. Shepard replies, no, like I said, you're fighting it. The reason's there. Look for it. You clearly believe in payback, so settle the goddamn bill. Shepard, he then leaves that church. Moments later, when Dizzy leaves the church herself, Officer Morgan and Swirsky are outside, waiting for her. They tell her to get in the back of their car. They flash her their gun, showing that they mean business. When Dizzy is in the back of their car, they begin driving. Eventually, the two cops start talking to Dizzy. They tell her, No hard feelings, right, Diz? I mean, what's past is past. Once we figured you knew what happened, we was pissed off. Real pissed off. But then, we guess he had a good reason to fill you in on what went down. Yeah, he must have had a good reason. That's the point, though, right? We can trust you. And hey, sorry about your kid, I mean... He had nothing to do with this. See, we got a bad tip. Hector was supposed to be alone. It was just supposed to be between us and Hector. It's not our fault your old man didn't understand how high the stakes were. He had no vision. You're better off without him. Dizzy, she doesn't realize this at the moment, but the truth is, these two dirty cops, Officer Morgan and Swirsky, they were working with her brother, Emilio and they assumed that Emilio was the one that told Dizzy what really went down. The cops tell Dizzy, You're better off. You're a smart kid. That's why he got you that gun, huh? <laughs> he's got more pull than we gave him credit for. In fact, he's looking for you. Be smart, Dizzy. Play this right. Your temper almost got you shot last night, comprende? Keep it in check. We'll all be living large. They give Dizzy an address to check out. Dizzy goes to that address, and her brother is there waiting for her. Dizzy tells her brother, The cops, Swirsky and Morgan, they killed Hector and Santiago, and they killed the OGs last night too. Emilio asks, How you figure that? Dizzy answers, They told me themselves, they're freaking loco. They're not going to stop till we're all dead. Emilio then tells his sister the truth. He says, Diz, you don't know shit. I got nothing to worry about from those two, comprende? Diz yells at her brother, Emilio, you can't be, you can't be serious. Those two bastards killed my family, your family. Emilio responds, yeah, well, I didn't have nothing to do with that. But Diz, let me tell you something about your man, Hector. He may have gone legit, but he still called the shots in the hood. And Swirsky and Morgan, they went to Hector. They made him a business proposition. The smartest thing in the world, a truce between the police and the kings. And Hector, he didn't see it that way though. He saw the police as a rival gang just looking to move in on what's ours. So Hector said no. Dumb bastard didn't understand that after he sat down with him, it was too late for no. He knew what they was up to. That's why they took him out. They had to. Last night though, you say you saw those two cops taking credit for my work? That's messed up. Yeah, Diz. I was the one that popped those disrespecting OGs. It was business. Emilio is admitting that he was the one that killed some of those King gang members the night before. Members of his own crew. He then opens up a car trunk and shows Dizzy inside, pointing to some bags of heroin. He tells her, Look at this, Dizzy. Heroin. Grade A shit. About 200 G's worth. 
I move in large quantities and the OGs, they was gonna shut me down. So I had to step up. I ain't like Hector, I took their deal. Swirsky, Morgan, me, we're partners. As Emilio continues talking, all of a sudden he gets shot in his knee and falls to the ground. It was Officer Morgan. The two officers then casually walk over to Dizzy and Emilio. They ask, Hey Emilio, how's it hanging? That's okay, don't get up. Emilio angry asks, What the hell's going on? Why'd you shoot me? Swirsky answers, I didn't shoot you. He did. Morgan jumps in, Sorry. Swirsky continues, That was some story you told your sister there. We figured you already filled her in. That's why she was acting the way she was. I guess we figured wrong. So Dizzy, now listen to this. That story your brother told you, well, guess what? He left out a few details. Your old man, what's his name again, Herman? Hector? How do you think that we knew he'd be out that night? Emilio set his ass up. Emilio blurts out, that's bullshit, man. Morgan shoots Emilio in the leg again. Dizzy, she cries out, stop it, you're crippling him. Morgan, blowing the smoke off of his gun, replies, no we're not. We're killing him. Swirsky continues talking. He says, Emilio, your boy Poppy. He got picked up for raping some white girl in the suburbs last night. Some skank he was dealing to. And guess what? He rolled over on your ass for that hit last night. You're a wanted man now, Emilio. And with that mouth of yours... <laughs> oh, what's that? Did you say something there, Dizzy? Morgan answers, yeah, she did. She just confessed to being his accomplice. Makes sense, right? So, these two cops had to end their arrangement with Emilio because the hit that Emilio pulled the night before where he took out some members of the Kings, well, one of his boys turned on him and Officer Morgan and Swirsky couldn't risk Emilio maybe talking and giving them up. Dizzy, she then uses the gun that Agent Graves gave her. She surprises Officer Morgan and Swirsky and shoots them, taking them down. The two cops fall to the ground, but they're still alive. They try to talk to Dizzy. They tell her, Come on, you know we ain't the ones you want to kill? No, we're not. In fact, we're going to need a new partner on the street, ain't we? Right, might as well be a civic hero. One who saved a pair of downed officers from the bloodthirsty little brother who murdered his own people. So yeah, what's it going to be? Dizzy. Dizzy, she then thinks back to her family being gunned down in the street by these two officers. Swirsky and Morgan keep trying to talk Dizzy down. They tell her, come on, Dizzy. You're a smart girl. The choice is obvious here. You just got out of the joint, kid. You don't want to go back. We're freaking cops, you dumb little bitch. You'll never get away with this. The whole world is going to be on your ass. Dizzy, she responds, bring it on. Dizzy then fires a few more bullets into both of the cops, making sure that they are dead. Emilio, seeing Dizzy gun these cops down, comments, Man, your ass got hardcore in the joint. I'm telling you, Dizzy, we keep it in the blood, we're gonna rule this hood, you know what I'm saying? Ain't nobody gonna blow us Cordova's shit we can't handle. Dizzy still can't forgive her brother for being responsible in a way for her husband and child's death, also for the death of others on their crew. She tells her brother, Emilio, ain't nobody gonna be blowing no shit no more. Dizzy then pulls out a cell phone and dials 911 to get the cops to come over here. She then tells Emilio, fuck you little brother, fuck you for what you've done to me, for what you've done. Dizzy is then pointing the gun at her brother, Emilio's crying out, wait, don't, Diz, I'm family. Dizzy responds, I ain't got no family no more. Dizzy, on the cell phone that is now connected to the police, says, hello, I'd like to report a shooting. After she's done on the phone, she takes some of the bags of heroin. She cuts them open. She starts pouring it on her brother, as well as pouring it on the two dead cops. Emilio, being shot in the legs, can't really move. He tells his sister, Look, Diz, just get me to my car and I'll clear out. There won't be any trouble. Dizzy is gonna leave her brother here, though. He keeps screaming out, Don't do this! Dizzy! Isabel! I'm begging you! I'm sorry! Please, 
If I go to jail, the men there, they'll know what I've done. They don't play. They'll never let me forget. I'm worse than dead. Dizzy coldly responds, Yeah, baby brother, you got real hard time coming. But I'm doing you a favor you'll learn. No matter how bad your life really is, it's still better than being dead. Dizzy, she leaves her brother, and she starts walking home. Along the way, Mr. Shepard pulls up in a car. Shepard is in the back seat. He rolls down his window. He tells Dizzy, You could have killed them, you know. You had every right. Dizzy replies, No. No, I didn't. Shepard continues, You would have gotten away with it. Dizzy answers, Well, that don't make it right. Know what I'm saying? So, is that it, Mr. Shepard? Am I done now? Shepard responds, That's up to you. He offers her to get into his car. Dizzy, she thinks about it, and she takes him up on his offer and gets inside. As the car drives off, Shepard tells her, Good girl, we have a lot to talk about. And then they ride off into the Chicago skyline. Alright, so that was the end of our first story arc. Now we jump into the second with 100 Bullets, Issue 4, Shot, Water Back, Part 1 of 2. At a poor, shitty bar named The Regent, a bartender, Lee Dolan, works there. Lee Dolan got caught with some child porn on his computer. He did not know how it got there, but his life got ruined because of it. And now he is going to get a visit by Agent Graves. Graves is going to offer him revenge. Agent Graves greets Lee, and they get to talking. Graves shows Lee a picture of a beautiful-looking blonde woman named Megan Dietrich. Graves asks if he's ever seen this woman before. Lee answers, no, but I remember her if I did. Lee questions, so are you looking for this girl? Graves answers, no, I'm looking for you, Mr. Dolan. Her name is Megan Dietrich. It was she that sent you all those pictures of naked little boys. Remember those? Lee gets defensive, saying, Look, buddy, you got the wrong Mr. Dolan. Graves continues, You're Lee Dolan. You used to own Dolan's on the Vine. You were named Los Angeles' most promising restaurateur four years ago. I had dinner there a few times. If I recall, the veal was exceptional. You had it all. Beautiful wife, smart kids, successful business, nothing but potential. That's too sweet. Living the American dream. And then, a knock on the door from the FBI woke you out of it. But then that probably seemed like a nightmare, didn't it? I'll bet you even went so far as to pinch yourself. What were the charges again? Lee answers, Possession and distribution of child pornography on the internet. Graves continues, I guess someone else appreciated your veal as well. Lee professes, I didn't do it. Graves continues, I know that, but it doesn't matter, does it? For all its sunshine, this city loves the dirt. You were convicted by the media before you even went to trial. Lee, see, the distribution charges were dropped due to lack of evidence. Possession, though, well, the pictures were on your hard drive, weren't they? Lee professes once again, I don't know how they got there. Graves answers, I do. So, you were labeled a pedophile, your wife divorced you, your kids were terrified of you, and no one wanted to eat your veal anymore. Your business went belly up, and you went bankrupt. The life you worked so hard to build was over. Lee riled up says, I was framed. Graves continues, that's right, by her. Graves points to the photograph of Megan once again. Graves then pulls out to the briefcase and opens it. He tells Lee, In this attaché is the proof, and as you can see, a gun and 100 rounds of ammunition. It's all yours. The bullets are untraceable. If you use them, they can't be linked to you. You're above the law. Lee, not believing this, says, Give me a break. What the hell is this all about? Talking nonsense. Giving me a gun. Graves responds, You lost everything because of this woman. You are what you are now because of her. Don't you think you should let her know exactly how you feel about that? This woman, Megan, she's going to frequent this establishment tonight. Graves, he then gets up 
and leaves. Moments later, Lee Dolan gets a phone call. It's the owner of this bar. They tell Lee, Hey, Lee, it's Bob. Listen, I need you to work tonight. Just for a couple hours. I need an extra pair of hands. See, we got this yuppie pub crawl coming in. Some rich bitch's birthday party. Yeah, they're going to be throwing a lot of cash around tonight. So it'll be worth your while. When Lee leaves that bar, he catches his son at a bus stop. He wants to talk to him. His son wants nothing to do with him, though. Lee calls out to his son, Hey, Jerry! But Lee's son, Jerry, says, Bye, Dad, I'm not supposed to talk to you. Lee asks, How's your mother and Patty? Lee's son, Jerry, responds, What do you care? They're not your type. What's in the case? Lee, to this, says, That's what I want to talk about. My second chance. I'm going to make things right. Jerry responds, Not with me, you're not. Just leave me alone. Afterwards, Lee, a little depressed, goes to a strip club to see a dancer named Connie that he's kind of formed a relationship with. Lee pays Connie some compliments, and then he tells her, So I saw my son today. Connie asks, So I didn't know you were married. Lee responds, What's that? Oh, I'm not, baby. If I would, I wouldn't be here. Connie to this says, Yeah, right. You're here for the same reason everyone else is. You're unhappy. Lee responds, well, that's the thing about us unhappy people, baby. Takes one to know one, eh? Later on in the day, it is finally night time, and Lee returns to the bar to work this shift that his boss asks him to. The shift where Megan Dietrich will supposedly be visiting. At first, the shift starts out normally, but then finally, the yuppie birthday party arrives. A whole bunch of rich people come in. They are just here to slum it. Like it's some kind of joke. A rich guy named Duncan, when he walks in, says, Oh my god, look at this place. You better watch where you sit. Finally, Megan walks in, and Duncan removes her coat. And then Lee pulls out his gun and shoots Megan in the head. No, he didn't. He was just imagining that. Megan calls out to Lee to order a drink. She says, A Manhattan, please. Lee pours her that drink. As the night goes on, Lee slowly tries to work up the courage to take Megan down. Eventually, he sees Megan head to the back to go to the bathroom. He follows her. Megan is in a stall. Lee goes in. He's working up the nerve to finally shoot her. He pulls out the gun. He's trying to steady his hands. He's sweating. But all of a sudden, Lee gets interrupted by a man and a prostitute coming in. The prostitute knows Lee and asks, Geez, what the hell are you doing waving a gun around? Lee, embarrassed, says, Thought I saw a rat in here. Megan exits the stall she was in. She tells Lee, If you want to catch a rat, try using a trap. Well, the night goes on, and Lee still hasn't shot Megan. Megan and her friends are about to leave. Lee notices Megan's coat. It's just sitting there on the bar. He sees a very fancy-looking brooch on it. The brooch has 13 written in Roman numerals. Lee snatches the brooch. It's an excuse to talk to Megan later. Before Megan's about to leave, Lee tells Megan, Hey, you're the birthday girl, right? I gotta buy you a drink. Megan replies, That's sweet, but no, thanks, we're leaving. Lee tells her, Well then, one for the road, for you, and all your friends. Lee pours for Megan and all of her friends a whole bunch of drinks. Then he raises his glass and cheers. He says, here's to Megan. Megan thanks Lee and says to the crowd, here's to Lee. They all drink their drinks and they head out. As Megan is leaving the bar, she turns to Lee and says, thanks Lee, see you around. And Lee menacingly, holding that brooch in his hands, replies, right baby, see ya soon. 100 Bullets, Issue 5, Shot Water, Back, Part 2 of 2. Is Lee going to kill Megan or not? Let us see. A week has passed since Lee last saw Megan. He is still in the bar. He phones his son, and he begs his son to come to the bar tonight. He wants to talk to him. He wants to tell him the truth about everything. Lee's son, Jerry, is still very reluctant to come by, but eventually says that he will. 
Lee, he then heads over to the strip club and talks to Connie once again. He tells Connie that she's a perfect goddess. Lee then asks her, Say, Connie, listen, I'm throwing a party later down at the bar. I was hoping you could make it. Connie responds, Sorry, Lee, I don't date customers. But Lee, he pleads, Connie, come on. If you say no, you'll wound my pride. I'll have to hide my face in shame. Then I won't be a customer no more. Connie asks, What's the occasion? Lee answers, Occasion. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, today's my rebirth day. Tonight, I'm a new man. Later that day, Lee goes over to the office where Megan Dietrich works. He sneaks by security and he manages to bullshit his way over to the front desk. Eventually, he gets a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Megan to return the brooch to her. They are in Megan's office alone. Megan tells Lee, I can't tell you how much this means to me. When I noticed it missing the next morning, I absolutely freaked out. Lee comments, yeah, it looked kind of pricey. Megan answers, oh, it's not that. This brooch has been passed down in my family for centuries. Lee to this says, gotcha, the old sentimental value, huh? Megan replies, something like that. Well, I'm just lucky an honest man found it. So few of you around these days. Now, I'd really like to compensate you for returning it. Lee, what's your last name? Lee questions Megan. So, uh, you don't know who I am? Megan replies, sure do. You're a lifesaver. I could make this out to cash if you prefer. Lee then pulls out the gun that Agent Graves gave him, and he points it to Megan. Megan does not seem scared in the slightest. She sees the gun, she sees Lee, and she says, Shall I add another zero? The conversation then turns serious. Lee tells her, Keep your hands where I can see him. Megan replies, Whatever you say. Lee continues, Right. I like the sound of that. You have any kids? Megan answers, I'm not even married. Lee replies, I was. I had two. Had. Megan assumes, Oh, they're dead? I'm sorry. Lee to this says, Nah, they're alive and kicking dirt all over my grave. You sorry about that? Lee then finally throws the accusations to Megan. He says, Four years ago, some pictures ended up on my hard drive. I don't know how, but you put them there. Megan dumbfounded asks, Pictures? Lee continues, Dirty pictures of little boys. Megan to this says, Oh, I see. That's trouble. Lee continues, Right. It starts with trouble, moves on to panic, then despair, followed closely by catastrophe. Along the way, you lose your family, your job, your friends, your whole frickin' life. Megan asks, well, where does it end? And Lee answers, right here, baby, with a dead man pointing a gun in your cute little face. Megan, she then decides to try and talk her way out of this. She says, hey, if you kill me, dead man, who's gonna give you back your life? Megan, she then calls over Lee to her desk. She says, come here, what's your social security number? Lee, confused, asks, what? Megan replies, come on, you're going to kill me anyway, right? What are you afraid of? Lee decides to see where this is going. He gives his social security number to Megan. Megan punches it in on her computer. She says, all right, Lee Dolan, this is your life. Looks like you no longer have any capital. Let's give you some. This bank is right down the street. Will a million dollars do? Lee questions, you can do that? Megan replies, yep. And then hovering over the delete key says, I can do that too. Let's see, your children have savings accounts. We could fatten them up a bit too. Or how about a clean slate? Maybe I'll change your social security number. There, now you have no history. Neat, huh? Boop, now you're back. You were dead there for a second, officially, I mean. Not really. Lee starts questioning Megan. How can you do that? Megan answers, you, of all people, shouldn't be surprised by what I can do. In case you're wondering, it wasn't personal. What happened four years ago, it wasn't personal. It was... We were... We were just playing around on the internet. Me and a few girlfriends. We were really high. We came across this site where we found those pictures. First, we were just grossed out. And then, I don't know, we got angry. I mean, kitty porn is illegal, right? But here it was on the World Wide Web for anybody to look at. So, with the push of a button, I sent the files out into the ether. I'd programmed them to instantly download onto 69 random accounts, 
registered to men. I figured you like this filth, fellas. You can have it. You got the pictures because you were online at the time we did it. Luck of the draw. That's all life is, Lee. A luck of the draw. Lee pours himself a drink. Then he questions. The FBI store in my house, you know. Me. Megan to this says, I didn't have anything to do with that, believe me. Maybe the feds were monitoring the website and followed the ether trail. Maybe your wife came across the images and she blew the whistle, but it wasn't me. I have nothing against you. It was just a prank. Lee, a little unhinged, replies, oh, I get it. It was just a joke. Well, <laughs> now you're going to get it too, right between the eyes. Megan to this says, wait, how did you find out it was me? Lee answers, turns out I had a friend I didn't know about. He told me all about you. He gave me this gun too and some untraceable bullets put me above the law. And to tell you the truth, I like the view. Megan asks, this friend of yours, you waiting downstairs, I take it, in a getaway car with a tank full of gas? Lee replies, nah, I get a feeling I'll never see him again. Megan, she tells Lee, look, I'm sorry for what I did to you, I honestly am. So, name your price. Lee tells Megan, this isn't about money. Megan to this says, that's where you're all wrong, Lee. It's all about money. If you haven't figured that out yet, well, your friend, why do you think he told you about me? Because you weren't supposed to think about it. Just act. Your friend was counting on this. That's why he chose you. Look around, Lee. This is a securities firm. I imagine you owned stock once. Lee to this says, I owned a lot of things once. Megan continues, well, I own lots of things. I'm not saying that to put you down, it's just a simple fact. I'm a very powerful girl, and powerful people have equally powerful enemies. Your friend, maybe, is one of mine. That, or he was hired by one, and he's using you to get to me. Think, Lee, you have a conscience, right? Well, your friend's asking you to commit murder. You see, Lee, in the final analysis, he's not your friend at all. What I did to ruin your life is unforgivable, but I can try to make it up to you. Your son wants to be a doctor, right? From the look of his records. You know he was accepted to Stanford and he can't afford it? Well, I'll add another zero to that money there. But if you kill me, all you get is revenge. If you let me live, you can start over. Get back everything you lost and so much more. What would make you happier, Lee? My death or your life? Lee, he thinks on it for a while, and then he tells Megan, deal. Megan then asks Lee for the gun. She tells him, you don't need it anymore, and any chance I have of finding out who put you up to this lies with that gun. Lee hands Megan over the gun, tells her she drives a hard bargain. Megan then tells Lee, so then, your account's at the LA Federal Bank, as I mentioned, it's down the street a block or two. Just show the teller your driver's license. There shouldn't be any problem. You made the right decision. Lee, he begins to walk away. He thanks Megan. Before he leaves though, Megan stops Lee and tells him, No, thank you. Mr. Dolan? My brooch. You stole it, didn't you? You're not an honest man at all. Megan then aims the gun that Lee just gave her, and she shoots Lee in the head, killing him. A whole bunch of Megan's security detail enter the room. They ask her, what would you like us to do with the body, Miss Dietrich? Megan responds, whatever you like. He doesn't exist. Megan then presses delete on her keyboard, seemingly erasing Lee Dolan from any government records. Megan soon gets on the phone. She phones an unseen figure. The unseen figure has a ring. The ring has a symbol on it that matches the one on Megan's brooch, a 13 in Roman numerals. Megan and this unseen figure are part of a group known as the Trust. We'll learn more about them in the future. Megan tells the unseen figure, I have a bit of disturbing news. Graves isn't dead. The unseen figure isn't happy. Later that night, in the bar where Lee Dolan usually works. Lee's son Jerry arrives on his dad's wishes, and the stripper Connie is there too. 
Jerry's asking people in the bar, where's Lee Dolan? He told me to meet him here. Connie chimes in and says, yeah, he said he was throwing a party here tonight. A bartender there replies, what? The only thing that drunk throws is his lunch up every goddamn day. You want anything, kid? Jerry says he wants a rum and coke. Connie offers to buy it for him. Connie asks Jerry, what are you looking for Lee for? Does he owe you? Jerry answers, hmm, you could say that. Connie to this replies, yeah, well, add another zero. And with this, we end Volume 1 of 100 Bullets. Alright, so that was the opening volume of 100 Bullets. Uh, let me go through my thoughts on this series so far. So I'm really liking the art style by Eduardo Riso. I love his use of shadows, and I think he has the perfect style for this crime noir kind of vibe this series is going with. I liked the uh, opening chapters here. We were introduced to Agent Graves and Joseph Shepard, so we are uh, very curious about both of them and what the deal with the briefcases is and what is Graves' motivation, so all that is very intriguing. I thought Dizzy Cordova's story was pretty interesting. Seeing her world, this Latino uh, gang crew, and uh, the various intricacies of their uh, gang battle going on, the dirty cops in the mix, uh, Dizzy, and this whole revenge story on her brother and these dirty cops was really fascinating, really fun. And I liked the way that series wrapped up where Dizzy, she got her revenge, and now she is off with Joseph Shepard, and we will see uh, where her story takes her in the future. The second story arc, the Lee Dolan one, I thought was also uh, really good. You know, his life really got screwed, and you want to see him get his revenge, although he fails in the end, which is kind of intriguing. And this Megan Dietrich, she was sort of the villain in that story arc, and she survived. And we kind of get hints of her importance and power in the world. And Megan's going to be a, a major character throughout this series. So very interesting hooks in these opening two story arcs. I thought a really great debut chapter. I'm going to give this volume an 8.5 out of 10. Thank you all for watching. And I'll be back next week with volume 2. And volume 2 is a long one. So we are really going to sink our teeth into the world of 100 bullets in volume 2. And learn a lot more. So I will see you all then there for that.